All right, so I think we're going to get started here. Um, so hello, welcome everybody to our first virtual Thirst for Knowledge. It's a pleasure to see all of you joining us tonight and we really thank you for supporting us during this time um, and sort of bearing with us during this transition to doing things virtually. So Thirst for Knowledge is an initiative that is sponsored by the Department of Physiology at the University of Otago and the Otago Science Museum. Uh, we run monthly events in which we bring science out of the lecture halls and into the public where we can engage with you guys. Normally, we will host these events on the last Tuesday of every month at Umbrellas, but of course today we are gonna be streaming live to you in your living rooms or wherever you might be right now. So before I hand it over to our speaker, Dr. Chris Moy, I just wanna go over a couple housekeeping rules uh, for the Zoom. So first of all, I uh, have you guys muted. So if you could just stay muted throughout the talk so all that you can see so that you can hear Dr. Moy, um, that, would be, that would be great. Um, it's okay to keep your video on or off during the talk. A lot of you have it off, which, which, is, which is fine. Um, it's up to you. Um, if, it, if your video is on and it's a little slow or a little glitchy, uh, turning your video off might, might help that, um, but it's up to you whether you keep it on or off. <laughs> um, and then normally we usually have an interactive Q&A session after the talk um, where you can engage and ask questions and um, start discussions. So we would like to keep that. Um, I think the best way to do that would be to first ask your questions in the group chat. So if you go down to the bottom of your screen, there's a little icon that says chat there. Um, if you could just ask your questions and you can send them to everyone or you could send them directly to Chris. Um, and that way we can just field through them. And then at that point, if you wanna unmute yourself to follow up or ask another question or start up a discussion, feel free to do that. Um, but I think just to keep things kind of smooth, if we could just start off using the chat, I think that would work really well. Um, so just to recap, keep yourselves muted during the talk, uh, video, okay, on or off, and then ask your questions in the chat and they'll be addressed at the end. Um, so without further ado, ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Chris Moy. He's a senior lecturer in the Department of Geology at the University of Otago. And he's here today to talk to us about his exciting research looking at the sediments in the lakes of New Zealand and how we can use that information to inform us about our past and our future environment. Um, so now I'll hand it over to Chris and he'll take over from here. Great. Hey, Christina, thanks so much. That was, that was excellent. And um, it's really nice to be here. Thank you everyone for, um, for tuning in, especially as we, um, as we transition in, in lockdown levels here in New Zealand. Um, I'm glad you're here and, and maybe not at, at KFC right now. <laughs> um, anyway, um, it's really good to see all of you. Um, I'll just quickly share my screen here and um, give myself a little bit of, of a better introduction. Uh, give me one second here. All right. All right, hopefully um, everyone can see that. Give me a, somebody give me a thumbs up if that's good. Excellent, thank you. Um, so uh, as, um, as Christina mentioned, I'm, I'm a senior lecturer in the uh, geology department at Otago University. And, and I consider myself both a, a geologist and a, and a climate scientist. And so um, my students and I spend a lot of time thinking about how climate um, has changed in the past, mostly in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and we also think a little bit about how the, the carbon cycle has also changed and how that might influence climate over various timescales. Um, and the toolbox that, that, I, that I use and I, and I spend a lot of time thinking about are both um, sediments, so using cores or um, long stratigraphies of, of sediment obtained from many different types of settings. Um, and I apply um, a number of different stable isotope techniques to look at past climate change. So essentially, we're, we're collecting these cores 
and we're taking uh, measurements down core further back in time and we're using this information to, to better understand our, our climate past. Um, and in New Zealand here, I've been, I've been an autographer for almost 10 years now, um, developing records from both lakes, um, peatlands, uh, fjords, as well as um, some ocean basins. So, so I'm gonna share some of those um, results with you today. Um, one aspect of this type of research that really, that really, um, I guess that really drives the, the work that I do, that really interests me, and, and I guess is the passion behind the work that I do, is that is, is really the statement, or it's captured in the statement, in order to predict our planet's future, we really need to understand its past. And so that's, I think that's a really fundamental aspect of, of the field of, of paleoclimatology or or paleoceanography, understanding past climate change before the instrumental record. And this instrumental record of climate is, is really relatively short. I have two uh, figures on this, um, on, this, uh, on this screen here. I'm gonna use this little spotlight here to highlight some things. But on the left here is a map. And what we're doing is just looking at, at plots where, or data points that, that correspond to the length in time in years of, the, of a climate record. And so the dark colors here correspond to the greater number or the, excuse me, the, the longer length of each individual record. Um, and you can see how that distribution works, right? In Europe and in North America, we have a lot of these reds and, and dark reds and blacks. But, you know, especially as we look towards the Southern hemisphere, these dots get further and further away from one another, and there's less of these red colors signif signifying longer records. And so the instrumental records that really span the last hundred years in the Southern Hemisphere are relatively few. And so, and a problem associated with this lack of, these lack of records and the short temporal duration of these records is that we don't really fully capture the full extent of the climate system from these really relatively short and disparate records. And so we need to kind of go back in time um, into our climate past to really understand how, um, um, to really understand the full range of climate conditions we might expect. And so this is a really a, a driving force behind uh, a, a lot of paleoceanographic and paleoclimate research. On the right here, I'm just showing a, a figure, a compilation of, of many of these temperature records, especially the ones that extend farther back in time, showing the last 150 years or so. And you can see the rel relatively, well, you can see the changes certainly within the last, since the 1980s, how it extends um, to greater temperatures um, towards modern day. So the key here in terms of um, addressing this problem of short records is to really to use the paleoclimate record or the, or the, or the geologic record to look at, look at our past. And so um, one of the ways that we do that um, as, as geoscientists is to, is to use this incredible tool. And this is the Joides Resolution. This is a scientific drilling ship um, that's part of the International Ocean Discovery Program. And so this is a ship that's been, through various iterations, been operating since, well, when it looked like this, probably the last 20 years, but we've had uh, previous ships that extended us back to the 1960s that essentially produce this compilation of dots on the seafloor. And so these are our cores of sediment and sometimes rock um, collected from essentially all the ocean basins. And the ocean basins here are, are really helpful because they can really help us get farther back in time and generate continuous paleoclimate or paleoceanographic records um, that extend maybe even 50, um, 60 million years into our past. So that's, that's one important aspect. And as, as New Zealanders, um, uh, we are we're really fortunate. Otago, Victoria, and um, GNS Science are members of this consortium. We, par we partner with Australia and we access the ship. And these purple dots here correspond to drilling locations that were drilled actually just about um, 12 months ago um, in the South Pacific Ocean. And this is an expedition that myself, as well as my, my wife, Christina Rieselman, who's here as well, um, participated in and, and collected some, um, um, collected many sediment cores. And, and this is just to give you a sense of what these things look like. Um, these were cores collected in, in one of these uh, spots over here. Let me um, make sure I have my, um, my little spotlight on so you can see my, 
so you can see my pointer a little bit better. And so these color changes correspond to different microfossils that are present in the sediment. And as we go down core, we go from the top of the photo down towards the base, we're essentially going farther back in time. And by analyzing a lot of different things, maybe it's the geochemistry of the, of the sediment, maybe it's the distribution of the different microfossils that are present. This can tell us things about um, sea surface temperature, it can tell us something about ocean circulation, um, it can tell us uh, something about the, the temperature of the ocean at depth. And so these are really, really valuable. And all of these different records help provide, um, help provide us or provide us with, uh, with context, right? Where we can take that, that relatively short 150 year period and place it in the, in the scope of maybe um, t um, say 60 million. And that's actually something I'd like to do right, right now on this, on this next slide here. Um, and so on my right hand side here, or on the right hand side of this slide, I'm actually just gonna use my pointer here. Um, we're looking at a, essentially a, a time series or a time evolution. We're going from um, present day right around here. Um, and in, in towards right here, we're going towards the future. And we have a number of different projections of our future temperature change. On the left-hand axis over here, the y-axis here is, is change in temperature. And so this black line is the instrumental record. And we can start looking back in time using different types of, of paleoclimate records. Um, and one type of record that's really valuable, certainly for the last 20,000 years, and in some places to almost six or 700,000 years are the ice cores, both from Greenland as well as, as Antarctica. And so they capture uh, a time range within this square here from what's referred to as the last glacial maximum. This is, uh, this is when ice was significantly expanded over the South Island. Um, My camera and it shows, so I can't see you. Say that again. Oops. I'm sorry. Me. Um, so starting from the, the last glacial maximum um, towards the present Oh, it day. wasn't muted. <laughs> gotcha. So you can see the, the temperature change, right? That occurs from 20,000 as we go um, into what's called the early uh, Holocene. So this is about nine or 10,000 years ago. And this is a time period I'll, I'll come back to because um, I think this is a really good analog for our climate future in New Zealand, this, um, this early Holocene time period between about, let's say, um, 11,000 and about maybe 8,000 years before present. As we go farther back in time, um, we can now we're getting another factor of 10 in time. So here we're looking at change between 100,000 and maybe 400,000 years ago. And this is where the marine sediment cores in, in this green here, um, excuse me, in, in blue here, um, start to provide some really nice perspective. And here we're, we're looking at these, uh, what are referred to as glacial and interglacial cycles. And we have these intervals, these interglacials that were um, either as warm as pre-industrial times or, or maybe even slightly warmer. And so these are um, times when the, when the Earth's climate was a little bit warmer and it gives us opportunities to not only to see how um, different aspects of the climate system has changed in the past, but we can really start to get at, at processes that drive climate change. Um, as we get farther back in time, we hit, we hit this interval called the Pliocene. And the Pliocene is, is about four to five million years ago. Um, we, had, we had carbon dioxide concentrations, estimated con uh, concentrations that are about similar to today. And temperature maybe two to three degrees warmer than pre-industrial. And so this is another interesting analog period for understanding the climate processes that operate under warmer climates. And then we can go back to about 60 million years or so to the early Eocene. This is our greenhouse. This is often referred to as the greenhouse world where we have temperatures much greater um, than today. And, and certainly um, life on, in New Zealand and, and many parts of the Southern Hemisphere were, were quite different. So again, these records combined can tell us a lot and they provide great perspective and we can use them to um, help us determine how the climate system works. Um, I'm gonna shift gears here and, and, and move us back towards New Zealand and, and especially the South Island. 
Um, one of the things that, that I'm really interested in is looking at how rainfall has changed in the southern hemisphere mid-latitude mid -latitude since really the, the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago, and, and in particular over the last 12,000 years. So on, on, the, on the left here, I have, a, um, I have uh, just, a, just a, a map of, of precipitation amounts, annual precipitation amounts, and, and I've highlighted three locations on the southwest margin of the South Island in purple and in blue. And these, this, these are areas that I'm sure many people are familiar with in Fjordland and in Southland where we get vast amounts of rainfall each year. Now, just comparing the, um, the time series or the, the, over the 40 years that rainfall data has been collected at these three points, we can look at the year-to-year -year variations and see some of the, the, the trends actually that have occurred over this 40-year time period. And one of the things when we look at December, January, and February precipitation accumulation, so this is rainfall that's occurred during the summer months, we can see over since the 1980s, so we have time on the, on the x-axis and then um, standardized summer rainfall on the y-axis. I'll come back to this um, in a second here. Um, oops. So just give me a second here. I'm going to turn this off and just use the uh, cursor here. Okay, so um, one of the things that we notice is, is this decline in, in summer uh, rainfall uh, throughout the southwest margin of the South Island. One of the things we also notice when we compare data from these three stations um, is that we see a lot of year-to-year -year variations. We have uh, clearly wet summers where we have above average um, or um, rainfall amounts for this period, and we also have some dry periods as well. Uh, the black line here is just an average through these three points. And a key driver for these year-to-year -year precipitation variations are really the, the atmospheric circulation in the southern mid-latitudes. And it's really the, the westerly winds that drive it. And so this is a, um, a common scene both on, in southern Patagonia, where I've spent a lot of time doing my, um, where, I, where I did my, my doctoral um, research or my PhD research. And then also in the southwest margin of New Zealand as well, you see these really wind sculpted trees that are really impressive. And these are sculpted by the westerly winds. And on the, on the right hand side, I'm showing these two donuts that really essentially map the westerlies over the southern hemisphere. And so the red colors here correspond to really strong westerly winds. So we're looking at the west to east component of wind velocity. And so, um, you can see that when we, we either we look at the annual average or the summertime average, you can see this um, big ring that encircles um, the Antarctic continent. And it's important for us on the South Island because if the core of the westerlies, the strongest winds move closer to the South Island, we get more rainfall because we have more storms that are circulating within this belt of strong westerlies impinging or impacting on the South Island. And so the westerlies play a big role in our in our day-to-day -day climate, especially um, especially here um, on the Antarctic Riviera in Dunedin. Um, so I'm going back to this this plot that I showed you before, and just looking at the year-to-year -year variations. And, and one of the big kind of drivers of these year-to-year -year variations in rainfall is um, is related to the westerlies and the overall position, the latitudinal position, and the strength. And, in, and an index that really well captures that, that, um, that uh, changes in the strength and, and latitudinal position of the westerlies is this thing called the SAM or the Southern Annular Mode. And all this is is just an index. It's an index like the Southern Oscillation Index, um, where we're just looking at variations in, in pressure between the mid latitudes over us in New Zealand and over the Antarctic continent. And so when this index tends to be more positive, what that does is really, it takes those westerly winds and actually pulls them close to the Antarctic continent and actually intensifies them a little bit. In the opposite phase, um, we get kind of an opposite um, occurrence with respect to the westerlies, where the westerlies tend to migrate a little bit um, northwards towards, towards New Zealand, towards the South Island. And we can see some relationships between 
um, precipitation here. This is our average, the dashed line from those three stations in the southwest portion of the South Island and the SAM index. It, 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 it explains maybe about 50 to 60 percent of the variability, the year to year summertime variability. So not all of it. We have these intervals like here where we see a almost a mismatch between the two. And during those years, it's oftentimes that El Nino plays a role in, in controlling precipitation on the South Island. So they work together in concert to influence our, our rainfall. And so that's, that's something that's, that's important. Um, you can see what happens when the, when the SAM gets really positive and it really pulls those westerlies away from New Zealand. And so the strongest westerlies are, are now in the sub-Antarctic and, and closer to the Antarctic continent. And so this provides an important model, and we can test this with the paleoclimate record to see if we see kind of similar variability and, and, and look at mechanisms for this change. This index also plays a role in our own happiness here in Dunedin. And so on, on this graph here, I'm just showing um, Dunedin sunshine hours in orange, right? And the SAM index in, in blue here. So in this case here, I, I have the axis going up in the right way here. So more positive SAM is, is up. I should have explained this in, in my previous graph here. This axis is inverted. So we're looking at more positive SAM index values here corresponding with, with lower rainfall. And again, because it's the westerlies are pulling the storm tracks south away from, um, from New Zealand. And so one of the, the drivers of the, of the research that we're undertaking is that many climate models forecast a greater tendency for this positive phase of the SAM in our future. And so this will fundamentally impact the amount of, of, of water the South Island receives, the amount of precipitation it receives. And so we're really trying to understand that and we're trying to use the, the geologic record to get some guidance on, on how, um, how much water or what water deficits might look like under some of these regimes when the westerlies are really contracted southwards towards the Antarctic. And so to do that, we, we've taken a couple different approaches, but we're, we're working both in the fjords on the southwest portion of the South Island, as well as in some lake settings on the, on the eastern margin of the, of, the, of the Southern Alps. And so these are areas where we expect a very strong connection between the strength of the winds and precipitation. And so this is an area that if, if the westerly shifted south, we would really expect to see that um, change in rainfall in these localities. And so again, the, the westerlies are a really uh, an important driver of climate change. I've talked about how they play a role in the southern hemisphere and mid-latitude pre precipitation. It certainly impacts New Zealand, southern Chile as well. Um, they also play a really important role in the Antarctic cir circumpolar current, essentially driving that really strong current around the Antarctic. Um, and then through that process plays a role in, in how much carbon is either brought up to the surface or downwell into the ocean. Um, I wanna take you on a, on a bit of a, a field trip here and just um, take a pause here for a second and go back to another application and show you essentially some of the things that we do in the field uh, to collect these sediment cores and, and how we arrive at some of the interpretations um, we get. Um, before I do that, I'm just going to check in real quick with Christina. Everything okay? Okay, wonderful. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen again. All right, Every, Christina, can you see that? Okay, excellent. I'm going to make it full screen. All good. <laughs> and, um, and so this is one of our sites that we're working in. This is called Lake Vaughan. It's, um, it's in the Vaughan Valley, just south of Lake Wakatipu. It's probably just due east as the crow flies is of Lake Teano. And actually, I'll play this, I'll talk over it and I'll play it again just so you, you can see it. And, and we're focusing on, on this lake in particular. Um, as you can see, you can see we're getting our, our coring gear um, ready to go. Um, there's a PhD student working with me, Greer Gilmer, who's working up one of the records from, um, from this particular site. Um, one of the reasons we chose Lake Vaughan is that it's a, it's a closed basin lake. And so um, from the drone footage, you can see that there's not many, there's not any surface outlets, right? And you can see that pretty well in this image. We have a small few, a few number of streams that enter the lake, but for the most part, um, the lake level is, is controlled um, basically by the precipitation to evaporation ratio. 
And so we've been collecting cores from the center of the lake and from some of the shallower margins as well. We're just gonna um, start us again at the beginning and just quickly pause it. And, and you can see evidence for these, for these lake level variations by looking at the position of the shoreline, right? You can see these like bathtub rings around the lake. And, and that's, that's evidence of just even recent changes in, in lake level. Maybe it might be at the seasonal time scale, right? Um, but we really wanna focus on some of the long-term variations over the last 12,000 years. Um, you can see that the topography around the lake is really um, hummocky. And so we're looking due north right now, again, towards Lake Wakatipu. You can see some of those, those hummocks and you can see really nicely some of those um, um, previous shorelines. But this is where essentially ice terminated during the last glacial maximum. Essentially, we had a, a big lobe of ice coming up from Lake Wakatipu and producing um, a lot of these hummocks um, in the terrain. And, and so the sediments that started accumulating in this lake um, are relatively old. They, they get, um, they, they're about 16 um, and a half thousand years or so. I'm gonna stop it one more time here. This gives us another good view of, of our bathtub rings. And, and one of the things that you can see quite nicely is, is along the shoreline here, um, there, you can see it's really, really rocky. You can see there's some coarse cobbles and, and, and pebbles on the shoreline, and that extends into the water. And, you know, it's, it's, the, um, it's the number of, there's a fair amount of wind mixing and, and reworking here that takes fine grain sediment and pushes it into the lake here. And so we can look at past variations at lake level by just monitoring um, the proximity of the shoreline to some of our coring targets. And so if we had a core collected over here, we'd expect grain size to increase. We'd expect the nature of the sediment to increase as lake level drops and the shoreline approached. So these are some of the, the techniques that we're, we're doing at this, at this site. So again, we have cores from the deepest part of the lake, about 14 meters, and we also have some cores that were collected um, farther, um, farther, um, uh, farther to the north that are in shallower um, areas of the lake. And these are what some of the sediments that look um, that we get out of it here. Okay, I'm just gonna switch you over real quick back to my PowerPoint. All right, and so when we're at one of these coring spots in the in the center of the lake, what we end up doing is take lots of copies. So we, we have a number of different holes and we can line up the stratigraphy and look at some of the changes. And so these are some examples. So starting at the top of the stratigraphy going down, um, we get to older sediment. Um, this next core section starts essentially at the base of the previous, and we go on towards deeper um, into the sediment stratigraphy. And then finally we get to these blue green or blue gray um, sediments that are really, really fine. And these are, these are essentially glacial flower sediments that were produced when, when the ice was still in close proximity to the lake about 16, maybe 17,000 years or so ago. Um, but you can see how we might stitch these records together. Um, you saw in the video, we take these one meter sections and what this approach does is make sure that we don't have any gaps in between adjacent or in between, um, in between drives. So again, you're looking at um, a couple of, um, well, just an overview of the lake and where are these cores that we've been recently taken. This is, um, again, Greer Gilmer, she's working, uh, part of her PhD focuses, focuses on generating a high resolution um, kind of lake level record from, from Lake Vaughan. And one of the things we're doing um, is just comparing records from the shallow parts of the lake with the deep parts of the lake. And one of the things we see in the shallow record is this really, um, important discontinuity right here, and that's labeled U1. And this is essentially an unconformity. It's a gap in our sediment record, and it occurred when lake level got so low that it actually overran the core site. This is the, the 2013 core site over here. And we tell time in these records by, by radiocarbon dating um, different parts of the, of the organic components that are in the sediments. And so we can constrain this unconformity to about 3.2 to about 2.8 thousand years or so ago. And I'll, and I'll come back to that later in time. But this is, one of the, this is one of the unconformities that we see in our stratigraphy. And you'll notice that we don't really see good evidence of that in the depot center. 
and so in the deep part of the lake. And so by collecting cores along a, a transect of depths, we can start putting together quantitative lake level reconstructions. It's really important when doing this work that you compare your records with others within the region. And I'll show you some work that we've done in uh, South Mavora Lake. And so this is one of my, this is actually my favorite lake on the South Island. It's a beautiful setting. If you, I don't know if anybody's um, been up there, but it's, it's, an, it's amazing. So South Mavora Lake is here in the foreground and North Mavora Lake is in the background, uh, just beyond this little um, hill over here. It's just east of, of Teano. And, and so we've been collecting a handful of cores, both sediment water interface cores, and with colleagues at Otago, Sean Fitzsimons in the, in the geography department, and Jamie Howarth, now at Victoria, we've, we've collected um, some longer records as well. And I wanna take you through our, our, our thinking about the Holocene, the last 12,000 years here, and I'm gonna do it in, in a stepwise fashion. Um, what I'm starting off with here is, is, is what's very common in this field, is, is, is the wiggles, right? Comparing the wiggles from different sites. And I'm starting out with, with two records or a compilation of, of two different types of records. This one here at the bottom is from a, a marine sediment record off the coast of, of, of the South Island. And it's showing uh, changes in, in sea surface temperature made by a, a geochemical proxy. It's a biomarker proxy, essentially. Um, from alkanones. And then above that, I'm showing a, a proxy or a reconstruction that Janet Wilmshurst and her colleagues at Landcare Research have done, um, looking at actual the pollen in, in New Zealand lakes. And from two, actually, um, one's, I think they're both peatlands, actually, on the South Island. One is Longwoods, and the other one is, um, is uh, Ajax, I believe. And so, these are showing the variations in, in temperature change over the last um, 12,000 years. And one thing that comes out quite clear is this, this early Holocene bump, right? Where it's, it's, um, it's certainly the, the warmest part of the stratigraphy. And a lot of people think that it's a few degrees warmer than, than pre-industrial times in New Zealand, maybe even two to three degrees warmer than today. And so that's our early Holocene warm period in, in, on the South Island of New Zealand. We can start integrating some, um, some of the records that we have from around the South Island now. And so one is this reconstruction that a former student of mine, Peter Burrington, did looking at actually leaf wax molecules extracted from the sediment. And so this is the, the sediment stratigraphy from South Mavora Lake. And what Peter did was he took some of this bulk sediment, um, extracted some of the, the molecules, and measured the high hydrogen isotopic composition of those, of those molecules. And that tells us something about rainfall amount, as well as evaporation, um, as well as the source of rainfall as well. Um, and so one of the things that we can point out really, really um, clearly is this early Holocene interval. It's, it's relatively elevated relative towards the, the present day or the most recent or latest Holocene portion of the record. Um, these molecules are, um, to, to make this a relatively to make this relatively short, um, we can look at the amount of carbon atoms that these molecules have, and they can tell us a little bit about the source of where they de were derived from, either from algae, um, from aquatic plants or macrophytes that grow in the lake and use the lake water, as well as long chain or, or, or molecules that are essentially derived from the trees surrounding the lake. And we can actually make some comparisons in the isotopic composition between some of the, what are referred to as intermediate chains versus the long chains, and, and start to pull apart trends in evaporation. And that's what's, what's shown here in this, in this stratigraphy. And so we see some of these, these periods of enhanced evaporation, essentially bigger differences between the lake water and, the, and, the, um, and what we derive from um, precipitation on land. Um, these are showing up or they co-occur with some of these warmer intervals in the different paleoclimate records from land and from sea. Um, we can also shift um, up towards, south, excuse me, to Lake Hayes. So this is um, a lake around Queenstown, closer to Aratown. And, and this is a, some work that a, a former student of mine um, did, Jessica Inahosa, um, looking at the same type of, of molecules, essentially the same leaf waxes but focusing on ones that record lake water changes. And again, the early Holocene period sticks out as a period of enhanced evaporation in this site. 
And we actually think that Lake Hayes might have become more of a closed restricted basin relative to what it is today. Um, on, the, on the left here, I'm showing some of the photos that we, some of the technology that we have to core some of these lakes. And this is one of our, our larger pontoon systems that we, that we put out on lakes as well as on the fjords. Um, finally, let's, let's pull in that Lake Vaughn data. And so we have two unconformities in the Holocene. And one was that one I showed you um, occurring around 3000. And this other one we have, it's not as well constrained by radiocarbon dates, but this also shows up in the early Holocene as well, kind of around the same time where we have warmer temperatures. And we can go even farther afield and compare some of these variations to um, variations at the core of the westerly wind field, the modern core anyway, in Southern Patagonia. And these red bars correspond to two identified um, warm and dry periods in Southern Patagonia. And, and these show up quite well with some of our South Island records. And, and taken together, what it's arguing for is either a really poleward contracted shift of the westerlies or, or pronounced weakening of the westerlies um, during that time period. And so this is, this is important for, for a number of reasons. If we can figure out what hydrologic deficits were like and quantify them in the South Island, then we can get maybe a really nice or a really close modern analog to some of the future changes that are, are, are projected um, for the, the next handful of decades, maybe at the end of the coming century for the South Island. And so we can provide a little bit more perspective there. We clearly see that it's dry. We want to really know now how dry. And also we want to know the spatial patterns of drought around New Zealand. So not only focusing on the southern part of the South Island, but other parts of the North Island, especially Northland, which is really impacted by, by summertime droughts, especially over the last five or six years or so. So these are, these are some of the ways that these, these geologic records or these um, paleoclimate records can provide some important perspective. And from this information that we've gathered so far, um, you know, I would say that you know, the last thousand years or maybe even 2000 years really don't capture the range of hydrologic deficit um, that, that is possible. And so it, it's really important to focus on some of these, these time intervals. One of our challenges with these records is you'd notice that when we look at the Lake Vaughan picture, I'm going back, you can see that that looks like a really dry, arid landscape, right? Not a tree in sight. I'm gonna go backwards two slides and go back to Mavora Lake. And so this is just one valley over. This is a part of the South Island that just didn't get burned um, over the last thousand years or so by changes in land use practices. And so the landscape around Lake Vaughan today is not really um, reflective of the last 10,000 years. And there was a lot of disturbance in, um, in these areas over the last, um, certainly over the last 400 years or so. And that makes it really challenging, this modern disturbance, to really take a record and place it into modern day context. But one of the, the ways we're going to try to get around that in the next, um, in the next few years is to really expand um, our work on remote lakes. And so, and to do that, um, I, I'm part of a, a program called Lakes 380. And Lakes 380 is aiming to look at approximately 10% of New Zealand's lakes over one hectare in size. So it's a pretty um, ambitious endeavor. And it's actually funded by MD. It's an endeavor program. And we're really interested in looking at past changes in lake water quality, lake health, and how ultimately climate drives some of these changes we see in the sediment record. So it's, um, it's something that's, um, that's, that's really um, a helpful way to, to kind of evaluate past change in a variety of, of localities. Um, so one of, the, um, one of the things that we can do within this program is go to really to some remote lakes that probably haven't had a very large human influence, if at all, over the last few hundred years. Um, and just to give you a, a sense of what, what this looks like, a big focus of this program, again, is, is the last thousand years and, and getting to the point um, just prior to first human arrival in New Zealand. So just prior to about 800 calendar years or 800 years before present day. And to look at a handful of different uh, parameters within the sediment cores. 
This is a large program. It's led by um, Susie Wood at Cawthron Institute in Nelson and Marcus Vandergoes at GNS Science. And it brings in researchers from Otago, Victoria, and many other institutes around New Zealand. Um, but one of the things, this is an example of some of the things that, that that's done essentially. We can look at the pollen distribution and see decline in native species once um, humans arrive to New Zealand. We can see changes in charcoal abundance that reflect or signal the burning of the landscape. We can see um, changes in exotic um, pollen in the, in, the, um, in the stratigraphy. And we can also look for the presence of introduced species um, by looking at DNA within the sediment. And that's, that's the part that I think is just really, really powerful, looking at environmental DNA in, in sediments. And this is an example from Lake uh, Panui on the North Island of Wairapa. Um, really showing that, you know, that cyanobacterial blooms that are observed to late today in the lake are only a recent occurrence within this long lake's history. And so it's through programs like this we can get a much better understanding, we can get much better perspective on, on climate changes as well as lake water quality changes over a long period of time. Okay, I'm going to, um, um, I wanted to, I'm going to actually just highlight, I'm just going to pause here. <laughs> and um, I think I've gotten to the point where um, it's, um, it's over 30 minutes. And I, and I certainly want to talk to people and, and, and answer questions that you guys might have. And I'm going to, I showed you my favorite lake on the South Island. This might be my favorite lake in the world. This is a lake called um, Lago Sarmiento in Southern Chile. And so these are the iconic Torres del Paine in the background. Um, it makes some of these crazy carbonate forming stromatolites that are really, really rare. The only place that I've ever seen them. Um, this is a, a photograph taken um, in wintertime and it's just, a, just an amazing spot. It's a, it's a nice time of year to work because the winds are often really calm in the wintertime um, in southern Patagonia. So um, let me just acknowledge um, both uh, Lakes 380, the University of Otago, and the Marsden Fund that supported a lot of this um, research that I showed. And really thank you for, um, for, uh, for joining us tonight. And um, this was a lot of fun. All right, yeah. Well, thanks so much, Chris. That was a really awesome and really informative um, presentation. You know, not something we all think of. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, very different perspective. Thank you. I hope it wasn't, I hope it wasn't too, um, you know, slidesy. Oh, no, <laughs> it wasn't really off the cuff, but um, yeah. anyway, these are some of the projects that I'm really excited about now. And, yeah, definitely. And I'm welcome. Yeah, happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Yeah. Ah, okay. So it looks like we have one from Anita. This is my daughter in law. Uh -huh. Chicken or an egg question. Which came first, atmospheric CO2 <laughs> or oceanic CO2? <laughs> Atmospheric CO2. Oh, you mean as far as origin or you do you mean as far as the timing of increase after the last glacial maximum? Maybe both. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can speak to the latter bit, um, not so much the, the first bit. Um, I, and early on it was um, it maybe even within the last few decades that people often looked at the the ice core records and and saw that maybe the temperature that we, so the ice cores contain both bubbles, which we extract the carbon dioxide from, which um, is, in, is in tune with the atmosphere at some point in the time, in, in the past. And then it also has the ice, which are obviously surrounding the bubbles. And so we get the temperature estimate from the ice and um, we get the CO2 concentration from the, from the bubbles. And so when we look at the reconstruction of temperature and, and CO2, um, I, think, I think even when we have relatively good understanding of the H models, sometimes the temperature is, is leading the CO2. And so it comes like, is CO2 really a driver of climate change if temperature is coming out of the LGM um, and is, is starting to warm prior to the change in CO2? And, and, and it's, it's a complicated transition, but what we've done with a series of, of, of really well-dated and well, um, 
tuned records where we can able to, to line them up next to one another. We can actually work out the process that, that gets us from a, um, from a, 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 essentially a glacial period to an interglacial period. And, and it's, it's, it's complex. It's, it it kind of starts in the northern hemisphere. There's signals that are transmitted to the southern hemisphere. And, and we actually see asymmetric warming between the poles during this important time period as, as climate begins to warm. And a, a big thing is, is that the Southern Ocean holds on to a lot of our CO2 during the glacial periods. And it's actually the, a little bit of warming a southward migration of the westerlies <laughs> and a and actually a big burp by the southern ocean is the sequence of events that takes place and so there's a lot of carbon stored in the southern ocean during the glacials and that's released during um, the deglacial period and that's that explains some of the reasons why we see these differences in timing between um, um, co2 and, and temperature but but it's an important thing to recognize that CO2 is a very big player in our, in our, in our temperature history. Um, it, it's, it's important today. It's been important, important for the last 60 million years. Mm -hmm. um, so we have another question. Um, can you please explain SAM again, the SAM? Sure. Our, our friend Sam. <laughs> um, I'll go back to, my, um, to one of my slides if that's OK. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so it's um it's a it's it's a it's it's an interesting index. It's um what it, it what we're trying to do with these with these climate indices is try to simplify um, a relatively large atmospheric process um, that impacts really the whole of the southern hemisphere, and the southern annular mode really is a, is an important driver of our of our climate on the South Island, and when we the southern westerly winds, those big donut patterns that I've showed, um, showed you in the previous maps, you know, those, the way those donuts look, whether how symmetrical they are or how strong those winds are, are flowing, they're really driven by the, the pressure gradients in the atmosphere. And so when, we, when I show you those donuts, we're averaging over many either monthly timescales or an annual timescales. But it's, it's really the, the pressure gradients between the, the low or mid latitudes and the high latitudes that really help place the location of this arrow where the westerlies are. And so when that gradient changes, that essentially the westerlies are along for the ride and they follow suit. And so when the, when the index, when the, when the pressure over the, um, over the Antarctic is either generally well, when it's anomalously lower in this index, um, <clears throat> we can get the gradient work where the winds actually contract around the, around the Antarctic. And they also often intensify. And because the southern westerly winds largely mimic the storm tracks in the southern hemisphere, it's actually going to pull a lot of the, the storms that would like to follow this, or that do follow this arrow, Essentially, they push them to the south and they, they go by New Zealand without really impacting the, the South Island. Um, conversely, when the, when the index is more negative, when we see this pressure gradient change, we can shift the westerlies farther to the north and those storm systems again will, um, will, um, will follow that arrow and that storm track and they'll impinge upon the South Island. And I think this is where I didn't do a great job at explaining here. So again, we're going back to our, our summer rainfall from those three locations, and I've averaged them with this dashed line here in black. And so on the y-axis here is, is summertime rainfall. Higher values on this side indicate um, more precipitation. On this axis over here, the second y-axis, I have the, the southern annular mode index, and here I've flipped it. And so more positive phases or more southward westerlies um, are on the bottom of the graph. And, and it's done to show the, the similarity of the trend over the last 40 years or so. And a lot of people, excuse me, there's been a handful of papers that have attributed this 20% decline in summertime rainfall um, to this shift in the southern annular, annular mode towards its more positive phase. 
Now, it's not the only driver of, of precipitation um, in, in New Zealand or in the South Island, but it's, a, it's an important one. It plays a good chunk of, of variability or it plays a big role in, in controlling variability. And so that's where I, you know, doing a second comparison was our, our Dunedin sunshine hours, right? When the westerlies are southwards of the South Island, south of, south of Dunedin, um, you know, it's, all the storms are transiting past. Um, and so, and southwards away from the South Island. And so we don't see as much influence. We have a tendency for more sun. It's not, again, not the only driver, but it, but it plays a role. Um, you can look um, up your, another name for this is the Antarctic Oscillation Index. And um, I'll share this screen with you. And this, and this is really illustrative um, illustrative of um, why it's not the only driver. I mean, today we had just a beautiful day, right? You know, hardly a cloud in the sky. And, and, and in this case, the index was relatively negative, right? And so it's not the entire driver of change, but, but, it, um, but it does play, um, it does help influence um, climate in Dunedin and along the South Island. You can also look at forecasts, so that can give you a longer range of what might be um, occurring. So, we so have, this is, um, you could find this um, by essentially, I just Googled daily AA, ah, didn't spell it right, daily AAO index, and that will, that will do that. And I'll put that, what I'll do is I'll put that index in the chat so people can find it. Cool. Yeah, so we had another question. Do the um, southwesterlies bring cooler temperatures as well as increased precipitation? Okay, sorry, getting distracted here. Yeah. Too many things. Um, let's see. Uh, the question, so the question is, do, do, do the westerlies essentially um, impact um, our temperature as well? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and absolutely, um, if the westerlies are farther to the north, um, oftentimes we see the traje trajectory of, of these parcels of air or these storms that are coming in off the southern ocean will have a, south, a southerly or southwesterly source. And so oftentimes they're associated with cooler, cooler conditions. Um, I have a question here. What is the reason for the blue coloration of the glacial flower in the in the cores? And this is really um, this is a really valuable um, um, kind of presence, I guess, in 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 the sediment cores. It really helps us understand where we are in time in, in some of these lakes that are close to the Southern Alps. Um, that glacial um, that blue color is is essentially associated with glacial flowers, so fine grain. Um, physical um, weathering of the catchment rocks by glaciers. And it's essentially, if you took a core out of some of our Mackenzie Basin lakes, um, like Pukaki and Tekapo, um, ones that have just that brilliant turquoise color, you would find the same thing in the sediment, that gray sediment. And it's just very fine-grained inorganic sediment. A lot of quartz, a lot of these catchments have a lot of um, schist in it. And that's just, it's really, has really abundant quartz in it. And, um, and that's how, and that's why we, we, we see that, that coloration essentially. It's, it's related to the, the inorganic content of the, of the sediment. And it tells us that there was essentially milky glacial flowery water in the catchment at the time. Do we have any more questions? All right, well, we'll give you a virtual round of applause. <laughs> thank you so much, you Chris. This was really oh, my awesome. pleasure. Thanks uh, for um, thanks for um, for attending. I, I'm grateful for that. And um, and you can you can you can Google me and see some of the things that we're up to on the Otago Geology web page. Um, so as th as these projects develop, especially Lakes 380, um, you can you can kind of keep track of our progress on that. Yeah, yep, yeah. and we can we can always post things to our Facebook group and things like that. Um.